The following program and contents, including the views and opinions expressed by the host and any guest speakers, are solely for informational and entertainment purposes. The views and opinions expressed are not endorsed or supported by Realma McConnell Media Company, the X Zone Broadcast Network, their employees, affiliates, or advertisers. The host and guest speakers are solely responsible for their own perspectives, and their views do not reflect those of Realma McConnell Media Company, the X Zone Broadcast Network, their employees, affiliates, or advertisers. The information provided in this program should not be considered as professional advice or as a substitute for professional consultation. Listeners and viewers are encouraged to form their own opinions and seek independent advice when necessary. Realma McConnell Media Company, the X Zone Broadcast Network, their employees, affiliates, and advertisers hereby disclaim any liability for any claims, damages, or losses incurred as a result of the information presented in this program. Welcome to Mission Evolution Radio Show with Gwilda Wiaka, bringing together today's leading experts to uncover ever-deepening spiritual truths and the latest scientific developments in support of the evolution of humankind. For more information on Mission Evolution Radio with Gwilda Wiaka, visit www.missionevolution.org. And now, here's the host of Mission Evolution, Miss Gwilda Wiaka. Thanks for joining us. Mission Evolution Radio TV show is coming to you on the Exxon Broadcast Network and the Exxon TV channel. Divisions of Relmar Media, excuse me, Relmar McConnell Media Company with studios and corporate offices in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada. Today on Mission Evolution, we'll be discovering the effective states of consciousness. Could a deeper understanding of consciousness make us more effective in our lives? Is consciousness even a thing we have any hope of understanding? With us this hour to explore the topic is Bill Harvey. Bill is an author and media research industry leader that has foretold and shaped the future of media for over 35 years. His website, humaneffectivenessinstitute.org. Bill, thanks for joining us on Mission Evolution. Gwilda, thanks for having me. So let's start out with Bill. What, what was your original education in? What's your educational background? I have a philosophy degree. Philosophy, interesting. So and what... my minor, my minor was psychology. Okay, well, those kind of fit together, don't they? <laughs> so, how did you become interested in consciousness? Uh, I became interested almost from my first memory. I was fascinated by my mind, and always using it, always thinking. Uh, very much a, of an alone person most of my early life. Meditating without realizing that I was doing that, contemplating, concentrating, doing all kinds of things with my mind and trying to figure myself out. So that one step led to the next? Well, there, there was a, uh, an important moment when I was about five years old. My parents who were in show business insisted that I had to perform on stage. They said I could abandon it as a career if I wanted, but as long as I was living in their household, they were performers. I was a performer and I was gonna get up there. So I hated the idea, but I did it. And that was about, I was about four years old when they first dropped that one on me. And after about a year of, I suspect, pretty lame robotic performances, I was starting to learn the act and then this thing happened. All of a sudden, I was on stage. I wasn't scared. And I, I, I didn't have any concern for whether the audience loved me or hated me. And I was having fun. I was, it was like playing. And, and then I realized I was still performing, but it was kind of doing itself. I, I didn't feel like I was performing. I felt like I was observing the Billy uh, on stage getting great laughs and applause for the first time. And I was kind of watching myself from the outside. I was 
almost having an out-of-body experience. I, I kind of sensed myself above and beyond, uh, above and be behind uh, my body. So anyway, that um, left me thunderstruck. It was an aspect of life I had never suspected existed. I didn't know what it was. Um, and I was unable to talk about it much because I couldn't express myself very well, even to myself. So I kept it to myself, but I became entranced by the idea of learning what that was and learning how to bring it on at will, if I ever could do that. So that accelerated my interest in my mind and consciousness. And it, it led me to continue to study myself. And um, as I studied myself, I discovered I was making an enormous number of mistakes every day. And I was making mistakes because of the way I was using my mind. My mind was throwing up various impulses, do this, no, no, do that, no, no, do this other thing. And I was kind of randomly choosing which ones to follow. And, and that turned out to be not a very good method. So I started to study my own methods for making decisions. I started to give myself a little more time before reacting to people's questions or to events around me. So I became a student of consciousness. You, you several times have um, mentioned consciousness and the brain as being kind of one and the same thing. Is consciousness in the brain or is it elsewhere? I believe, and I have some reason to believe, that consciousness came first in the, the universe and everything else came from consciousness. Therefore, the brain is really kind of like the personal computer for consciousness. It's an assisting tool, but not the principal source of our thoughts and feelings and intuitions. So that would follow that you're saying that consciousness exists outside of the human being, outside of the body. I, I, I believe that consciousness uh, transcends space and time that space and time are, uh, the one consciousness has created space and time as part of the overall game called, that we call the universe. I believe that we're all part of that one consciousness. You've stated that reality at its core is consciousness. What do you mean by that? Well, uh, you know, this argument or this debate goes on uh, from the beginning of history, from the beginning of history, deep thinkers have always thought that there were two primary conditions of life or reality. One is matter, all this solid stuff around us, the computer that I'm sitting in front of, and so on and so forth, and mind, which is what they called it at the time. They didn't call it consciousness. Uh, but mind and matter, the question always was, which had come first? Did mind exist first and then create matter or did matter exist first and create mind? It's pretty clear that in the current culture, the public perception of what science has taught us is that matter came first and that mind didn't exist until matter really matter and energy, two sides of the same thing. Matter and energy existed, banged against each other for a long time, kind of accidentally and randomly. And that started to create things that could reproduce. They were, they were things and they were living, that is animated, they were able to move around. They had senses like eyes and ears, uh, and they had a factory, or at least the female of the species had a factory where that reproduction of the species could occur. And all of that was an accident. It was just brute force smashing against brute force until this happened, which I find unlikely. Uh, and I'm in company with 
uh, Einstein in rejecting the idea that it's even vaguely possible that accident could account for this universe that we behold. So is is that the state you're talking about where matter came before consciousness? That's the theory. Well, the, the theory uh, of matter coming first goes way, way back. Uh, but it, it becomes exalted in the period since the theories about the Big Bang. So in the last hundred years or so, the creation myth of our culture, so to speak, is that nothing existed before and then there was this big explosion and then here were these bolts of energy and blobs of matter flying around. That, that theory was later modified by quantum theory. So in the 30s and 40s and 50s, uh, as quantum theory was being formed, uh, the basic premise of quantum theory was that even in nothingness, something is going on. And that something is going on. So uh, the most uh, articulate explanation of this was from John Wheeler, a uh, some somebody who was uh, very close to Einstein, worked with Einstein on atomic fission and uh, had been mentored by Niels Bohr and Gregory Bright and, and other uh, well-known physicists before him. Anyway, Wheeler describes the situation prior to the Big Bang as what there was was quantum foam. And the quantum foam gave rise to virtual particles that would appear and disappear. And then it was the quantum foam and the virtual particles that underwent a transformation that caused the Big Bang. Well, we're going to have to look into the Big Bang and the, the, the quantum field on the other side of a station break. Bill and I will return shortly, so don't go away. This is Mission Evolution, www.missionevolution.org. Are you interested in evolving with the times and becoming all you can be? Don't you wish there was one place to find the latest information to help guide you through the process? I'm Gwilda Wiecka, host of Mission Evolution Radio TV. Join me on my mission to find the latest evolutionary knowledge and tools. The guests on Mission Evolution are leading experts in a wide variety of divergent topics including allopathic, holistic, and integrative medicine, epigenetics, enlightenment, quantum physics, meditative practices, environmental issues, spiritual evolution, trauma healing, and so much more. Mission Evolution Radio TV is aired worldwide through the Exxon Broadcast Network, Exxon TV Channel 32 on Simul TV. You can enjoy our archives of radio or TV shows with our compliments at www.missionevolution.org. Come see the amazing lineup of guests and topics. With more than 200 episodes to choose from, you're sure to find what you're looking for. Visit www.missionevolution.org. What does consciousness have to do with effectiveness? With us this hour discussing this very topic is author Bill Harvey. His website, humaneffectivenessinstitute.org. Bill, we were talking about quantum foam and, and the, the, d discussing whether or not consciousness came first, you know, the chicken and the egg thing, or matter came first. And to, to shorten a little bit, am I to assume that you buy the second that, uh, that uh, consciousness came before matter? I do. I do. Um, but let, let me explain why I think this is not in uh, stark disagreement with physics, uh, quantum physics and relativity, uh, the most advanced thinking that we have. 
Uh, Wheeler discusses the vital role that consciousness plays in creating the universe of matter and energy as we experience it. What he describes is that prior to consciousness, matter and energy existed only as probability waves, not as the concrete trees and stones and bridges and things that we see around us that it required consciousness to interact with the probability waves. And by doing so, it caused the waves to freeze into the position that they were experienced as being in by consciousness. Thus, matter. Matter. Matter came from consciousness. However, he believed that in its primordial form as probability, as virtual particles, it came before consciousness. The way I resolve that is by suggesting that the quantum foam itself was consciousness, is consciousness. That what he describes as the quantum foam with its arising virtual particles, the same way that thoughts and feelings arise and disappear in our minds. Quantum foam from its description by Wheeler sounds very much like consciousness to me. Well, let's bring this down to the pavement. How do our identities and perceptions of self impact consciousness? Well, they're, they're intrinsic to it. It's, the question is, what is consciousness? This definition of consciousness question is arising right now because of artificial intelligence. Many people, including sophisticated people who created some AIs, are wondering whether those AIs are conscious. And I, I don't believe that they are because my definition of consciousness excludes that possibility. My definition is consciousness is that which experiences, which has subjective experiences. If a thing doesn't have subjective experiences, it's not conscious. Do you feel that at some point AI might advance to the point that it is capable of consciousness? Well, I, I think that it would take a long, long time to do it, and it would require some of the good ideas that some AI people are having right now, like the idea of having a, what they call a workspace in the computer, which they are trying to simulate a self by having that workspace. So you can have recurring uh, investigation of the same thing persistently over time, so they're, they're trying to take characteristics of consciousness and mimic them as best they can with computers. So how can we take, how can we take this, um, all these high, th high thoughts and bring them down and to be more effective individuals? You know, how, how does this serve the, the average individual, all this knowledge? I, I think that there are two major steps. One is leaving aside physics and everything we've just been talking about, leaving that aside for a moment, we all do have our own consciousness. Our, and our own consciousness is the most valuable thing we have. It's life itself. Without our consciousness, maybe we'd be in a coma and still alive, but we wouldn't know it. We couldn't experience it. We wouldn't have any fun. Uh, that's not a desirable state. So we have our consciousness, it's our major resource. Question is how do we use it most effectively to get the things that we are really inspired by? I, I would back motivate. up a little bit to something you said about being in a coma. There's been reports of people that are in a coma but they're really quite conscious of what's going on in the room around them. Um, how does that align with what you were saying there? Um, I probably have to correct myself. Um, in fact, you know, my wife has had that experience. It wasn't that um, she was in a coma. She was under anesthetics and she couldn't feel any pain. But during the surgical operation, she heard every word the doctors were talking about. They were talking about uh, Mexican food and the preparation thereof while they were operating on her. And they verified that afterward. So yes, uh, even in deep states of what appears to be non-consciousness, there could still be consciousness. And to further seemingly contradict what I just said, 
I believe that everything is made out of consciousness. Everything we experience, everything in the universe at its core is consciousness. And we're making matter and energy and space and time out of it. And the one self that exists is living through all of our roles, kind of like a game player in a video game playing through an avatar. You mean all our roles like human being, dog, tree? You and me. Are you including the inanimate objects as well in this? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that that goes back to ancient traditions that believed that everything had life, everything had consciousness, everything had spirit. I think that's a, a valid intuition. Now, science will rule on these things someday, but science is awfully close right now. Uh, Wheeler brought us very, very close. I mean, if you look at the three physicists that are most important to us today in terms of quantum physics and relativity, it's Einstein, uh, Wheeler, and Hawking. And and all of them, uh, in one form or another, agree with what Wheeler said, which is incidentally called the anthropic participatory principle, that consciousness is what makes matter look like it does to us. And why, why I say that that's important is science in the near future is likely to say consciousness may have come first. We may all be part of one intelligent consciousness. The universe may be intelligent. We can't rule those things out. Science has not implied those things in the last 200 years, and that's got something to do with the condition of our culture and the pessimism and lack of inspiration and, and so on and so forth. But so, so, Bill, again, I would ask you, how can we use this knowledge to impact our personal lives? How, how can we make this work for us? We, we need to practice metacognition. Metacognition is paying attention to your own thoughts and feelings. Right now, most of our attention is deployed externally to objects around us. And we are currently, as a culture, highly distracted. I mean, look at all of the media usage, multiple devices at the same time. Well, a lot of our attention is for sure focused outward. What's the purpose of focusing inward? Focusing inward allows us to understand where our different ideas, feelings, and impulses are coming from. We'll be able to, if we do that correctly, we'll be able to see there's a hunch I'm having. Why am I disregarding that hunch? I'm just continuing to go talking when I have this hunch that I'm offending somebody standing nearby. Why don't I pay more attention to my hunches? Also, why do I dislike that person? I just met them. I, I, don't, I don't understand why I dislike them. Oh, they remind me of somebody else. Oh, I got it. I have to neuter that this, this feeling of not liking that person because it's irrational. Or where did I get this desire that I'm now acting out? Did it, was it really my desire or is this conditioning? Is this something... are, are you talking about being conscious of our consciousness? Exactly. Well said. The guy who invented the term metacognition did that three years after I wrote my book, Mind Magic. I didn't know I was writing a book, a manual, to teach people to do metacognition until three years later when John H. Flavel created the word metacognition and it suddenly triggered in my mind, oh my gosh, that's what I've been doing all my life. So what's what's the result of metacognition? What, What can we hope to gain from it? More effectiveness, better performance at jobs, better performance in life, more emotional intelligence, a greater ability to understand other people, being a better communicator. Does this come from the sorting process of what is coming from me and what is old um, patterning? Yes. Yeah, that's part of it. But once you start paying attention to your own inner world, you also find some things that are uplifting. You find that you have courage. You find that you have love. You find that you haven't been expressing your love or your courage because of something else that's twisted it. You learn that uh, you've been using bad strategies and tactics and 
your work or in your fun time. You can find if out you all to, kinds of things. If you were to have to guess, what percentage of us, if we don't do any of this metacognition, what percentage of us is just knee-jerk reaction and not really coming from a place of conscious intent? Over 90%. So we're just kind of staggering around repeating our ancestors' mistakes? I think it's even worse. I think we're, we're making bigger mistakes than our ancestors had the power to make. We've invented all these great things, but some of them are weapons and very destructive ones. Well, it doesn't take the weapons to be destructive, does it? No, it's the people. It all comes back to the people, which is why it's so important for... Our mission is to evolve. We, now, when I say 90%, that isn't just my own thinking. If you look at the seven different networks that have been discovered in the brain just in the last 10, 20 years, one of them is called the default network, which is the one that's used most often and is very close to states of insanity. It's very close to the description I gave of the way I functioned as a child with one impulse following another impulse and no real way of sorting them out in an intelligent way. That's the way we use our minds. But neuroscience knows this as a fact. And metacognition brings on a different network. And the different network is called the executive control network. And well, the more we use- we're going to need to look at an executive control network, which is quite fascinating, <laughs> on the other side of another station break. Bill and I will be right back to continue this our discussion. So you stay right there. This is Mission Evolution, www.missionevolution.org. So I was watching the X-Zone TV channel last night when I was abducted by aliens and they kept repeating to me over and over again, SimulTV.com, SimulTV.com. What's SimulTV.com? That's what I asked them. They had it written on the side of their UFO. How do you spell that? UFO. No, I mean SimulTV.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Right. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Interesting that you were abducted by aliens in a SimulTV.com UFO last night. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Now that you mention it, I remember now last night, I was awakened from a deep sleep. My great-grandmother was standing there. She said she'd come from the hereafter to tell me about SimulTV.com. She even spelled it out for me. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. Wow. Yeah. Guys, you'll never guess what my psychic guru just told me. SIMULTV.com. Exactly. Are you guys psychic too? Of course. We all know about SIMULTV.com. SIMULTV.com. Are you conscious or just running on default? This is Mission Evolution, missionevolution.org. With us discussing the nature of consciousness, this is Bill Harvey. Bill, we were getting into the default settings versus uh, something you might be able to be more conscious in the control of. Would you continue with that? Yes. Um, you can be rational and emotional at the same time. One of the things we do in the default state is we love dichotomies. We love things that are polar opposites of each other. And we like to sort things simply into one bucket or the other. However, when we're being more rational about it, we understand that most things are on a gray scale. So you can be along a continuum and you can also combine opposites and you can create new things. Uh, and all of that creativity requires us to pay attention, to be able to control our attention. You know, you look at all the ADD, ADHD, all of the things plaguing uh, kind of, th these are on the upsurge, uh, medical cases on record. When you go back a certain distance, we did, didn't know about those things. Uh, I think we're adding to it. We're adding to it with this, uh, 
short attention span dopamine driven uh, media system where we're we're just trying to keep people's attention as long as possible. And we've that's learned keeping, that- like, we, like you were speaking, that's keeping the attention outward versus giving a person an opportunity to move inward and reevaluate. Exactly. Okay. So um, it looks like we're compounding the problem, yes? We, we are definitely compounding the problem. Okay. Uh, so, so as an individual, how do we combat that? It's around us everywhere. Well, there, there are um, some tricks that we can use that can help us get into the observer state, which is the state of metacognition. And those tricks include uh, not only consciously paying attention to what's going on inside of us, but also paying attention to what's going on around us and to doing both simultaneously and to hold back reactions for a longer period of time. So if you have an impulse, don't act on it immediately. Uh, I mean, those are some simple rules. Uh, a much more important simple rule is the danger of negativity. Let me go back for a moment to physics, just for a moment, to Wheeler. So Wheeler said that consciousness helps create the reality that we experience. So you don't really need physics to explain that negativity draws more negativity to it. And it propagates, it reproduces, it expands. You you can't fight negativity with more negativity. You just keep sinking lower and lower into negativity. So one of the simple tricks is when you sense any negativity in yourself, turn off the alarm. It's like an alarm clock. Remember the alarm clock. The alarm clock goes off in the morning. The first thing you do, maybe you thank the alarm clock, but you you turn it off. It's done its job because it's alerted you. Negativity is part of our being. It occurs as a survival-based mechanism to warn us about something. It's you know to alert us. And the thing we should do as soon as we sense our own negativity is to diagnose what's causing the negativity. So the first step is turn off the alarm, turn off the negativity alarm. You don't need to feel the bad feelings anymore. They don't, they don't feel good. They lower your immune system. Turn off the alarm, diagnose what makes you feel negative right now and solve the problem. Think about how to solve the problem. Move out of the problem definition stage. Negativity is a sign that you're just wallowing in the problem negativity state. Turn off the alarm, diagnose the problem, solve it. Those are the only things to do. Let's take the other side of that coin, Um, just to be the devil's advocate. What about if we follow positivity until the point that we're also polarized in the other direction and we become airy-fairy and ungrounded? That's damaging, but it's not as damaging as negativity. (laughs) There's definitely, uh, in the case of positivity, you can take it too far. And what you want is a balance, a rational balance. How do you know when you're taking positivity too far? Well, you may find that you're buttering somebody up. And it may be fairly obvious to both of you that you're buttering them up. That's a you know, fairly obvious thing to, to catch. I much rather would see us all making that mistake than the mistake we're making now. But it's a, it's, you're saying it's a balance between the two? No, I, I think what we have to balance is our positivity. We have to definitely quickly move out of negativity while using its advice. The advice is something's wrong, something's making me feel bad. What is that something? How do I solve it? But don't stay in negativity. It's just to bring your attention to something. What What about, you know, there's a lot of large problems, and that's what we're being confronted with on the media, okay, is seemingly unsolvable things. How do, how do we work with that? Um, we shouldn't be attached to the outcome. We, we should prefer to reach an outcome, but we shouldn't get attached to it. As soon as we allow ourselves to become addicted to success 
in anything, it begins to change us internally. It makes us needy and dependent. It makes us uh, unable to perform at our highest level. Well, th this seems a little contradictory to me. In one sense, you're saying the way to turn off the alarm and then look for the solution. And then you're telling me, don't be attached to having a solution. Don't be attached to having it work. Don't be attached to, especially don't be attached to having it work quickly. But then doesn't that throw you right back into negativity? It does if you don't have the rigor of your own self-discipline. I mean, metacognition ultimately has to work with both the emotions, feelings, and images in the mind, and mental verbalization, everything that constitutes your consciousness. So you have to have mastery over all of that. It has to be, you have to have integrity. It all has to fit together. It all has to work together. And if you, if you look at performance and understand human performance, whether it's sports performance or musical performance or scientific performance, performance is hampered when you're too attached to winning. So where does spontaneity fit in here? Spontaneity is very important in the flow state. Now I mentioned metacognition and I also mentioned the flow state. Those are the two states of higher consciousness that I'd like us to focus on. Metacognition is the more achievable state. There, there are some simple rules. We can all learn to do that. So is I'm sorry, is metacognition a bit like having an internal witness? Yes. That's why so I call it the adult, observer. There's an adult present kind of thing. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And flow state is a higher level that it's very hard to get into if you're not already in the observer state. If you're working off the default network, suddenly plunging into flow state is unlikely to occur. But if you're in the observer state, it's much more likely to occur. Flow state is when your talents and gifts and skill sets are well balanced with the challenges you currently face. And you can actually enjoy engaging in some form of activity that isn't so easy that it's boring. It's demanding your best performance, but you're enjoying it. You don't care about the outcome winning or losing. You just care about doing this thing that you're having so much fun doing. And that's so is, when you give your best performance. So is the default state more um, reactive and the flow state more proactive? The, both the flow state and metacognition, the observer state, both of them are more proactive because you're actually drawing upon your own free will rather than on conditioning by other people or you know, institutions or culture or whatever. You are bringing out yourself. Whereas in the default state, you're not even thinking about that. You're not thinking about anything very much. It's kind of free association. It's random chatter. It's a free association. You're jump jumping from one thought to another thought to another feeling. It doesn't really matter to you. You go in and out of daydreams. Then you start to worry about something. That's the default state. It's very unguided and unproductive. Well, what motivates so many of us to be stuck there? Well, I don't think, I think it's simply we're not aware of the options. I mean, there, there's, we're not taught in school that there are levels of consciousness. Should, should I, that be fairly organic um, rather than having to learn a method to access consciousness? Shouldn't, shouldn't that be just kind of a natural state? I think maybe it was a long, long time ago. You know, if you go back to Neanderthals, uh, there's a lot of evidence now from archaeologists that Neanderthals were great hunters and were very capable of tool usage and inventing things and thinking out situations um, much wiser than we get, gave them credit for. Um, back then, life was simpler. There wasn't that much coming in. There wasn't that, mu that much impinging on us. That suddenly changed when language became visible 6,000 years ago, 
Why was that important? Every species has a dominant sense. Dogs, cats, it's smell. Whales, dolphins, it's hearing. Primates, humans, apes, monkeys, chimpanzees, it's seeing. Vision is our dominant sense. 70% of the energy in the brain is being used by the eyes. When you close the eyes, energy usage in the brain drops sharply. So eyes are everything to us. And when we were just talking language, we were able to coordinate the hunt and do valuable things monosyllabically. Once we were able to start encoding our language and stuff we could see, it changed our whole thinking process. Well, we're going to have to look into how that thinking process changed. You've got it on the other side of a station break. Please stay with us as Bill and I continue to examine the nature of the universe. This is Mission Evolution, www.missionevolution.org. Do you have a product or service you'd like to promote to a worldwide audience? Imagine your product featured on Mission Evolution Radio TV. If you're interested in showcasing your work, Mission Evolution is broadcast to the Exxon TV Channel 32 Simul TV, on the Exxon Broadcast Network, YouTube, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, Audible, and many other audio and social media platforms. Our professional studios can produce and broadcast your custom high-quality ad. It will be permanently embedded in each episode and featured in the archives for years to come. Together, we can make it happen. Contact us at info at missionevolution.org for more details. Spaces are limited, so don't miss out on this great opportunity. Email info at missionevolution.org today. Is the universe trying to give us clues? This is Mission Evolution, missionevolution.org. We're continuing our discussion with Bill Harvey. Bill, let's get into um, the thing that you've been dancing with here, um, is these effective states of consciousness. And we were discussing how maybe that was a natural way before, but it's not necessarily our natural way now. You also brought together how everything, by the way you're looking at it, has consciousness and everything is involved in the consciousness. That being the case, is the universe trying to give us cues and clues? Can we look into our environment and find clues into what's an effective state of consciousness? What's an inner inter way of looking? Uh, I believe that the universe is definitely giving us lots of clues. And uh, the most obvious ones are synchronicities where we may be thinking about something and all of a sudden the music we're listening to, a line of the lyric has a, an amazing bearing on what we just thought a second ago. That kind of thing happens to people all the time. And most people just ignore it. I think about what is the universe trying to tell me and I usually get something out of it. So that is that when the, when the inner awareness and the outer awareness come together? The information mixes, suggesting that that really we are part of a whole. But from what you've been saying, we first have to unbury our consciousness versus our default setting in order to make those connections. We have, yeah, because we're not paying enough attention. We've been distracted. The culture has become, in the last 6,000 years since written language, has become, I call it acceleritis. We're, we're just accelerating faster and faster and faster every year. And um, it's very, very distracting. And as a result, we kind of stop thinking about certain things. Anything that's complicated, like what do I want to be when I grow up? Or what is the universe? I mean, we all have this awe and wonder when we're children. But we lose it. Because we, we just can't, we don't have the time to think about that. Life is rushing at us. We're just trying to keep up the pace. And so we subscribe to popular notions that are offered to us. They give us choices. Here, you can have capitalism. Here, you can have communism. Here, 
you can have Republicans. Here you can have Democrats. Here you can have Christianity. Here you can have Buddhism. So all we have to do is pick one. And that's much easier. So that's what we do instead of thinking for these things ourselves. But it's much more valuable if we think them out for ourselves. So again, how, how can an individual, what are the steps for an individual to reach a more um, effective state of consciousness uh, rather than knee-jerk reaction? Well, there are three special times of day. When you're first waking up in the morning, before you get out of bed, maybe even before you open your eyes, then you have to have a 20 minute alone space during the day. Just tell people you're meditating. They'll, they know what that is and they'll let you alone for 20 minutes. And then just before you go to sleep at night, those are three key times to remember this conversation. Because when you first wake up in the morning, sense inside yourself, are you ready to leap up in joy and face a new day as a tremendous challenge and opportunity? Are you enthralled and inspired by this great new day that's dawning? Or if you don't have that feeling, why not? You know that you know, that would make you more effective and you'd have a better time. So try that in the morning. Then at, let me skip over the alone space for a moment, come back to it. And then when you're going to bed at night, there are two things to do. Look back over the day and anything that happened that you think wasn't quite perfect or even worse than that was humiliating and mortifying and the worst thing that ever happened in your life. But things that you weren't pleased with, that you had some control over that you kind of screwed it up. And think about what you would do next time in that situation. And when you've gone through the day and you've, you know what to do next time those things happen, then go on to the second thing, which is to contemplate tomorrow. Kind of do a mental rehearsal of that, what that day is going to be like. What are the major events? What do you hope the outcomes will be? Pre-dream, that is, intensely visualize the way you want it to come out. So the way when, you, when you're doing this, are you, in effect, setting your intent for what you wish to create or co-create the next day? Yes, exactly. And um, the alone space, the 20 minutes, whether you use it for any other form of meditation or, you know, mind magic, uh, what mind magic advises that you do, which is a form of meditation, whether you use some other form of meditation or my forms of meditation, use that 20 minutes to really catch up with yourself. How's your life going? How's today been going? What's good about it? What's bad about it? What could you fix? What could you do better? Use that 20 minutes a day kind of like as a daily reassessment of everything. So is that a time when possibly a person could spend some time journaling? Absolutely. Definitely. Take notes. Absolutely. So what's, 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 how does that help? <laughs> so we look at it, okay, it was this, it was that, we judge it, we put it in a box. How, how is that going to help us? How is that going to help us be more effective? It's going to see how we've been undermining ourselves by negativity, for one thing. So we're going to be able to rise above negativity. Can we undermine us... ourselves by being Pollyanna and being overly positive? And not Definitely. recognizing? Okay. So Definitely. either one can be an issue, is that? Either one could be an issue, but the one that we culturally have the biggest problem right now is world cynicism, pessimism. People cringing at idealism, the cringe reaction to idealism. Anything, anytime you try to say something positive in social media, somebody's going to jump on you and call it hypocrisy or whatever. It's that, that's much worse than Pollyannishness. But yes, I totally agree. So, um, so we've taken those three steps. What, what changes can we expect to see or, or what, where do we have to go from there? We're going to start having creative ideas, possibilities that we hadn't thought of before. Maybe um, kinds of work that we want to do that we're not doing now. You know, it, it, ever since COVID, people have become more aware of their dissatisfaction with the jobs they landed in through the default network, through living a life driven by the default network. Now they're spending all of their time at a job that doesn't inspire them, or 76% of us um, 
or according to Gallup, or, or in that condition right now. So uh, think about how you might make a transition to a, a better life. We'll start to get ideas like that. You may also start to get a sense of the fact that you are getting messages from the universe. And it may come in the form of hearing a voice in your mind saying just one or two words that have great meaning to you all of a sudden. And you, because you're paying attention internally, they kind of rock your boat and you say, wow, wow, why don't I do that? So is, is this kind of like when you're in the default state, there's nothing new. You're doing the same old thing in the same old way and maybe expecting different results, which of course is the definition of insanity, right? Exactly. But if you're in the introspective state, or it, does that put you in connection with, say, the unified field, the unified consciousness, and something new can come forward that hasn't already been a rerun? I think that's uh, definitely part of it. No question about it. Uh, there are... The word inspiration, it's received knowledge. And even the word Kabbalah means received knowledge. So the ancients knew about received knowledge. Every religion that was formed was formed by the originator receiving knowledge by inspiration. We all can get inspiration from the benevolent field around us. Why is it benevolent? Because we are it, it is us. Why wouldn't it be benevolent? Well, Bill, it's time in the show when I have to ask you, what's your mission? Uh, my mission is to get people into higher states of consciousness and to stop rejecting the possibility of God. So the possibility of God, how do you have to define that? I define it as the intelligent universe, which is a single consciousness. So the big one. <laughs> So the big consciousness. Yes. Interesting. What's your vision for the future if we all start becoming uh, more proactive and coming from a place of consciousness versus the knee-jerk reaction? Well, once we accept that, I mean, if, here, here's my preferred scenario for the future. Science comes out and says, we were wrong. We implied that we have proven that there is no God. There could be something like that. The universe could have intelligence. This could all have come about from that. We could all be a part of that. We can't reject that as a possibility. Then given the permission by science, the culture would change to one in which we're always thinking about, well, I better cover both possibilities. There could either be God or could they not God, but just in case there is God, let me make sure that my actions would work in that universe, work well in that universe, as well as in the universe where there is no God. Let me cover my bets. That right away would lead to better behavior and a reduction in negativity and more caring about other people. What about creativity? I mean, we've got a lot of things that need solutions now. Do you see this new state of being is, is providing more of that? Flow state manifests as three new motivations. Creativity is the first one. It's the first stage of higher consciousness is when we, when we move. Actually, right below that stage is a stage where we experience true love. And true love is really the, the on-ramp. But then creativity, self-knowledge, and then self-transcendence, meaning it's not all about me. Wouldn't that be nice if people could start to see that, right? Yes. <laughs> well, we're, we're, we're just about to the close of this entire program. This segment is, uh, it's been wonderful having you, but unfortunately we are out of time. We thank you so much for coming on the show. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. Our guest this hour has been Bill Harvey, the author of six books, including his latest, A Theory of Everything, including Consciousness and God. To find out more about Bill, where you can find his books and the Human Effectiveness Institute, visit humaneffectiveinstitute.org. This has been Mission Evolution with Gwilda Wiecka. For more information or to enjoy past archived episodes, visit www.missionevolution.org. But most importantly, please be sure to join us right here next time as this mission will continue, bringing information, resources, and support to our evolving world. Thank you.